this video is actually going to get to stay up forever. It's a returning series. It's a long-lasting series, and it is wrestling's most controversial moments. I believe there are seven or eight wrestling's most in the series, and we're going to yeah. release those the first Thursday of every month, and they're going to stay up here at youtube.com slash Casey Vault. Um, Sean, how did the wrestling's most series come about? There was a show on VH1. It was a countdown show. They would do, I don't know, most uh, most controversial songs or whatever. And it was a, it was a countdown show uh, hosted, well, not so much hosted, but but with celebrities commenting on um, on the, the countdown, they they didn't only do music. They actually did like 80s TV show countdown and movies. So they would have uh, performers from the pop culture uh, era that they were discussing come on and do the countdown and comment on on the items that were coming up in the countdown. So we said, well let's have a let's have a, a, a wrestling one and the way we were able to do it was we would shoot because we were shooting i mean at one time at our busiest we we're doing 18 full-length shows a year i think that was the most stocked our release calendar was um so we have people coming through all the time i love the 80s thank you that yes. was uh, Salvatore threw that up there. And then that team eventually started out. They did a thing called Best Week Ever, and it was the same team. Oh, really? The okay. people liked that. Like I would call it their content farm, that it's like, let's do a decade show, but then let's also do just a weekly week, week in review show. Right. It's just talking heads. Like back when, right. back when a million people would watch something like that on regular TV every week. Right. So we figured let's do a half hour show. Let's do it. Or, or were they an hour? I don't know. You guys will tell me how long the uh, wrestling's most were. I think maybe they were an hour. Um, so rather than the regular two hour shows or the, the 90 minute shows, we'll do a short um, uh, one hour show where we did wrestling's most blank. So it would be uh, wrestling's most controversial moment, wrestling's most awful angle, wrestling's most awesome manager. So we, we would put it out to fans on our website and they would vote. They would get like three weeks to vote. We would direct them there. So the countdown was legit. It was entirely uh, fan driven. <clears throat> so at the end of those three weeks, whatever the results were, um, that was it. It, it. it went out and then we, we got to, to sit a talent down and do the countdown with them. And we would uh, we would do it usually after we do one of two ways after a shoot. Like, let's say we, we did a, a timeline fit Finley. Um, we would shoot the show and break, uh, change camera lighting, put up the green screen and do uh, read him the countdown and get his reactions to the countdowns. And so with fit there, we would do one whole season, which I think it was four per year. We would release one per quarter uh on the calendar so we would do the four countdown topics and have him react to the five uh in the countdown the other thing we would do is we often shot shows at conventions so we would leave a day or a portion of a day with the the wrestling's most set up in the corner we'd be doing timelines and you shoots over here but we had that over there so that when we had breaks in the production schedule, like in between a U shoot and a timeline, because I didn't have enough to do that day, hmm. I, I, we try to grab a talent and run them in for a half hour and shoot uh, their their countdown segment. And then they'd go out and we grab another talent and run them in. And that allowed us to get access to people that had never been on KC shows, um, like Abyss. Uh, who at one point he was doing the Joe uh, Park thing, but um, I knew he was a fan and I knew they'd never let him do a full show. So, but we were able to run him in and get the countdowns for him. So he was able to appear on a KC uh, countdown show. So that's how we did those.
Black Saturday, Crucifixions, Andy Kaufman, the 2020 Expose, Curtain Calls. Wrestling has had its share of controversial moments, but we wanted to know what you thought was the most controversial. So on this show, we'll count down your top five choices via our online poll at kayfabecommentaries.com. And we'll see what the stars of the ring have to say about your choices. So let the countdown begin. These are wrestling's most controversial moments. We start with the number five most controversial moment, and it carries on the tradition of bookers who have never wrestled winning heavyweight titles. Remember Jim Barnett holding up that NWA title in the center of the ring? Remember that? Me either. But I do remember Vince Russo doing it. No, that is controversial because how in the world could he even, he's not a wrestler or anything and he wins the title. That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Okay, don't remember because that was so insignificant. And that's a top five? That's five? Really? Controversial angle. Poo, boo, horrible. When was that? It was still in WCW, so I was like, I think I was eight. It's the year 2000. <laughs> I really have no comment on Vince Russo winning the WCW title. I think it's kind of a waste of airtime, to be quite honest with you. Very controversial, yes. Uh, I, I would say that that, was, that would be in the, at least the top five for sure. Yes. <laughs> you really want my comments on that one? No, I never saw it. And uh, I'm, actually, I'm glad I didn't because I probably would have had a really bad taste in my mouth for a long time and spitting for a long time. Well, I can't figure it out. You know, I mean, I didn't know Vince Russo at the time. All I heard about, I don't know Vince Russo. I've never met Vince Russo. But all I've heard about Vince Russo has been 98% bad. Anything involving Vince Russo was controversial. No matter what you think about the guy, whether uh, he was a, he's a great story writer or a lousy story writer, he's always going to draw controversy. The world title belt on his waist, ugh. Please. Vince Russo, of course. I mean, but you know what? That's that's a trend that you, t you see on the indies all the time. Maybe he started it where the uh, the writer, producer, Booker puts the belt on himself. So maybe that's where uh, every every indie in the uh, in in North America got it from, and probably around the world, where the Booker automatically puts the belt on himself, usually over a top name. So it makes perfect sense. But uh, you know, hey, who am I to question his creative arti uh, or artistic ability, right? I j I just don't think that that w event was too controversial based on the players involved. Vince is a writer. And he was pretty much really the writer that came in and changed the business as far as writing goes. So I think that that gave a good soap opera writing angle to wrestling. Vince Russo and anything behind, except behind the stage is uh, rotten, rotten. Well, I think that's ridiculous. It devalues wrestling because it's not wrestling anymore. That's what's wrong with it. Oh, it's one of those things that it, it, I can't, it's like one of those things that you like to somehow figure some way to pretend that it never happened. But it did happen and it's, uh, ooh, how do you forget it? it it's, for, for anybody that came up through the, through the territory years and realized the importance that was put on the world title and the guys that held the world title and how they were revered, for lack of a better word, by everybody else in the business. And then to have Vince Russo reduce it to that and do it with a straight face where he justified it as compelling television. It's, uh, it's horrible. Dusty was good. He was entertaining and he drew people. Russo never drew a dime. That's the difference. When you start taking people behind the scenes and putting them in the forefront and in the wrestling business, it kind of becomes a mockery, my own opinion. I think guys that write shows should stick to writing shows and guys that are performers should be performers. That's ridiculous. That, that's like putting non-wrestlers in the Hall of Fame and the wrestling Hall of Fame. Why would you do that? He never wrestled before. He'd never been trained. He was a, 
uh, a video store salesman from Long Island. He worked in a video store, and him and this little fat friend of his had a radio show once a week over on Long Island. They 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 bitched and pissed and moaned about everything in the wrestling business till till uh, Linda McMahon said the best way to shut this guy up is to give him a job. So they they hired him to write for the magazine. How do you pretend that never happened? And how you know? Yeah. <laughs> You can't, how do you justify it? You know, it's, it's like what, what everybody worked for. And there was some guys, like I said to myself, okay, I'm proud of what I accomplished as a performer, but in my wildest imagination, never saw myself at that level. And so to have been in the ring with a Pat O'Connor, Harley Race, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk, Terry Funk, was an honor in and of itself. Not thinking that somehow maybe I deserved consideration that I might be elevated to that point. And then to have in the same breath, somebody talk about listening to the history of champions and to on that list have, I can't even say it. It's, it's, it's uh, embarrassing. I see back in the day, I mean, NWA was probably one of the greatest territories ever, even better than, you know, WWF in the older days. I mean, I was, I mean, I was raised old school in this business, so I was shown every video from every territory and organization, organization there ever was. And most of the stuff I watched was old NWA stuff. I mean, you had Steamboat and Flair going their one-hour broadways. That was classic, great stuff. And then when Bischoff and Russo got a, you know, got a hold of it, it just became a joke. It just became a soap opera, and it just, I think it totally devalued NWA. I think I don't think anybody even remembers the quality NWA was because all they think of is the crap WCW was. You know, you guys got like the gentleman you mentioned. You know, Harley Ray, Story, uh, Ric Flair, all these guys for years and years and years. You were proud of their product because you knew they were going to be effective in the ring. You get this jabroni to steal Cheeky Baby's word, it makes it look good, horrible. When they put belts on guys that aren't in the business, that aren't your TV stars, I just, I think it's, it just, it takes away from everything that everybody works for. Every, you know, when, when guys work to do that, that means something. You've worked hard to get there. They don't just hand it to them. Well, in that case, they handed it to them, but they don't just hand those out. I mean, if they did that, I'd go to Walmart and get me one. If he won the title, then I should have won the title. <laughs> It's like a guy that buys a ball, ball team, and he makes himself the star. The people and their fans are saying, what the hell is this guy doing? He owns a team. He should, you know, it's like Ted Turner. Ted Turner was okay until he took over the manager position of the Braves. And then the, the fans adored him before, and then they farted at it because they figured just because he owns a team doesn't mean he's going to be a manager. Of course it devalues your product. Vince Russo? I, you know what, and I really don't know the man, um, but I think that he's riding his own freaking ego wave. Vince Russo, you know, has a good mind for the business, but he thinks it's far better than what it really is, you know, uh, in my opinion. Um, Vince Rugo, uh, Russo is an egomaniac, and uh, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, that's a more credible thing, having a guy that's been in the business now, if he can be impartial and put the title on himself or somebody else while he's Booker, it doesn't always have to be on the Booker. Um, but most of the time, a guy that's, that's booking, usually in a bigger territory like TNA or WCW or WWE will not put the title on himself. Of course he let himself do that because he was running the company. Did he deserve it? Absolutely not. Um, that just made WCW, I think, into more of a joke than it was. And I'm not a fan of the WCW days. Pre, before I was there, sure, maybe they had some good stuff. But the whole time I was there, uh, that place was just, can, can you curse on this thing? Absolutely. It was the shits. <laughs> Trust me. He had his good days and he had his bad days, just like every other booker. You, you can't say, hey, this guy's a genius booker. Everything he does is great. What about the stuff you don't see? What about the stuff that lays in that booking room that we don't see how stinky that stuff might be? I think it was something new and something that hadn't been done before. So therefore, it was controversial in many, of, many people's minds. I personally think that it was uh, completely logical. <laughs> when you add writers to the show, you should be doing stuff like that. He probably thinks he's, he's 
you know, a, a viable character, uh, and, and everybody really gives half a fuck about anything he does uh, on screen or, or, you know, or off it. So, yeah, I, I imagine when he wrote it, it sounded great in his, his head. That uh, I mean, but then again, these, you know, you're talking about the same people who, who sat around in a meeting somewhere when they said, uh, oh, you know what? Uh, Mae Young is going to give birth to a hand, and everybody goes, that's fucking great. Let's run with that. So I'm sure when he put it on paper and he said, you know what, I'm going to put the strap myself, a bunch of yes men went, <laughs> fucking A, right you are. Anybody can be a champion if it's wrote in, but nobody can be a champion if, if, if the booker decides that um, they didn't do all the right things and they weren't the right person, they didn't have the biggest muscle. So um, good for you, writing yourself in. I can't figure the sense of it. When he, no, he won what? He won the... WCW Heavyweight Time. Well, the company's out of business, so he's probably a contributing factor to that. The fourth most controversial moment takes us to the New Jersey Senate and would change the course of wrestling history forever. For the first time, a promoter and owner admitted publicly that wrestling was fixed. Vince McMahon did it allegedly to avoid paying a tax. Number four, Vince tells the world, that's entertainment. By then, it, everybody knows, okay? It's a, you, now you're just trying to lie to the fans. I don't consider that as controversial as, as it, because it should have been said that a long time ago. Well, if you're going to save a little bit of money, I guess the man needs it. Of course, it's, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. You know, Vince wasn't telling anybody anything they already didn't know. I mean, it wasn't like the athletic commissions didn't know it was entertainment to begin with. And they knew they were stealing from the wrestling companies the way it was. There was no reason to pay that that entertainment tax and, and, and try to say that we were a sport when we were sports entertainment. Now, if we were 100% sport and nobody knew the outcome of the fight or the wrestling matches and everything else, it would be a different story. In, in, in retrospect, what, what is he, you know, what did he really, what did he really, uh, you know, you know, uh, he's just saying what everybody already knew, you know, and, and, and to me, you know, the whole, uh, I always got, I always had a problem with uh, fixed and fake. I always use the word fixed because it's no different than wrestling, no different than boxing and MMA. Don't be fooled. MMA is fixed and it's a work. You know what? That's, that, in my opinion, that's got a lot of positive influence on the business because it let it, it, let it go on to the next level as far as the way Vince was seeing it. And obviously it was a successful vision that he had. Um, but coming from where I come from, whew, that's strong. Well, it's still irritating. Vince McMahon, make up your mind, would ya? Back in the day day, when people used to say, well, wrestling's fake, you know, out you go. <laughs> you never use the word, the F word, in that, and that's good, yeah, because the F word is not my vocabulary. People used to ask me, is wrestling fixed? And I used to tell them I didn't know it was broken. As the business was, we were taught to protect the integrity of the business. And when he did that, a lot of guys got pissed off him at first, but then everybody got over it real quick. It was troubling, but uh, a lot of other things troubled me much more than that. It was a business decision that, and I think the national attention didn't really focus on, on that so much. Was there discussion in the, in the industry and wishing that he hadn't blatantly come out and said that? But everybody understand why he did. and. Um, uh, in a way, for me personally, I'm surprised it's even on the list. I don't think that's controversial at all. I don't think that's, uh, I don't even know how that made the list, to be honest. That, that's like a top 15, top 20, maybe, uh, top 5 or 10, no way. To me, that wasn't that big of a deal. Everybody already knew. He was just letting everybody know for a fact because it came from Vince. Mick, man. <laughs> it kind of was evolving into that anyways, you know. All the stuff has been on TV and everything, so he just came out and just said what everybody believed anyways. It saved him tax dollars, and of course it saved us from having to have these athletic commission doctors come in and give us tests all the time. And uh, I remember once in New Jersey, just before they, they, they abolished that commission, they sent us all in, made us be stress tested on a treadmill. 
And a stress test on a, t on a treadmill for people who've had one, uh, it's, it's enough to kill you right there. And if you've never had one, when you are finished with it, you wish you were dead. Oh yeah, they hooked us up to all heart monitors and all kind of shit. And then finally they got rid of that stuff. To avoid paying tax, now what people don't get is that Vince McMahon isn't a big, well, they probably do, he's not a big wrestling fan. Vince McMahon is running a business, and to run his business, and if he sees things are running, you know, too much, when I'm at Madison Square Garden, Vince McMahon says, well, I'm at the garden, this is costing me too damn much having to pay the athletic commission. So if he's gonna get off from, you know, uh, admitting that wrestling now is uh, entertainment and not a true sport to save his company dozens and dozens and dozens of paying out to the athletic commissions, uh, of course, it's a great business move. It pisses the fans off, but it's a great business move. Well, Vince, it's his, his organization. He can say whatever he wants to say. And it, and it went from professional wrestling to the entertainment business, so it was okay for him to say it. He's the one paying everybody. And it got that big, because it's entertainment. The fans aren't stupid. They go to see entertainment. They get involved with certain individuals. But you don't have to slap them over the face and say, hey, uh, what you believe in is all bullshit. You know, give the guy, give the state their due. Give Caesar what Caesar's, right? It's so sad that Vince went in front of uh, the Senate and told them it wasn't real because, I mean, it's entertainment, and if they didn't know it was entertainment, they could have done it privately and not done it like to where everybody knows. And I mean, people already knew. People knew that people know that TV shows aren't real. So why is it that he had to go in front and do that? Um, just kind of take and took that that belief away. It makes me sad um, that it even had to happen that way. That goes both ways. You can say it was a bad thing because we want to be, you know, considered a sport and athletes. But if you think about it, business-wise, it was a very smart move because it, we could avoid the athletic commission. Believe me, the athletic commission can be a real pain in the butt sometimes um, in a lot of states. I mean, Vegas, it's almost impossible to run shows out in Nevada because the athletic commission is so tight. Um, so business-wise, very smart thing for him to do. To a lot of old timers, maybe not so much, and they might have taken away their heart, you know, from the business. But uh, you know, money's money, and business is business. He had to do what's good for the for the business, for his for his business. Well, here's the thing: you're, you know, you're asking somebody who was in the wrestling business. I happen to be an excellent wrestler and and uh, learn wrestling, learn the the physical side of it. But I came from a theatrical side of it. And I also doing other shows and other activities at the same time I did wrestling. So, you know, on one hand, there was this wrestling, which is supposed to be sports. It's listed on sports and your television, you know, pay-per-view sports events. And then I was doing other shows where I was a member of SAG or AFTRA, you know, and that's entertainment and that's soap opera. So, um, you know, it, it irrit I know it was a way for him to cover all angles. But um, as far as being an athlete or an actor, or um, I don't think that we had the credentials to back it up. So that's, that's still something that I think is an issue for me. We worked our whole career trying to protect this business, make people think it's real, and he comes along and says it's entertainment. But by the same token, it's always been entertainment. When Jerry Lawler wrestled Andy Kaufman, it was entertainment. This was a long time before Vince ever said that. And then a promoter might book a match, and a guy goes out and misses a drop kick by five feet. The guy takes a bump. Well, haven't you already told the people it's bullshit right there? Because the promoter booked the match, the wrestlers didn't book it. It's, it's, you know, it now it puts more pressure on the guys to perform better to where you get that one in the front row when you hit somebody and they go, that was real. <laughs> It was going to expose a couple years later when the internet hit the, hit the scene anyway, right? Because everybody else, the internet people, all, all know that it's, uh, and they're all smarter than everybody anyway, so. I heard a guy that's really a, a name, become a name in the wrestling business in the last tw uh, 15, 20 years. Um, big guy. Um, he used that F word uh, in an interview that I saw him do uh, in reaction to a flare thing. And... Uh, he used that word, and I was watching him, and I just thought to myself, you, 
should have never been broke into the wrestling business. Because if you would have, and it would have been done right, you, that word would have never came out of your mouth in that context. So Kevin Nash, you don't belong in the wrestling business. Should have never been broke in. You're a big man. You think you're freaking all that, but you ain't. And uh, you should have, bottom line, you should have never been allowed to break in the wrestling business just because of that one thing. You use that word. And because I'm not fake. I'm not fake. My father wasn't fake. And uh, I know a lot, a lot of guys out there that those are fighting words. And I don't care what Vince did to expose it all, those are still fighting words to me. ECW turned heads and broke all the rules when they popularized hardcore wrestling. But one angle in particular on October 26, 1996, may have just been a wee bit too risky and sacrilegious. Your third most controversial moment, ECW crucifixion. Whoa, this is rough. I must have missed that. <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound like it was too effective. I don't know. I mean, there's so much you can do in wrestling, you don't need to go there. I don't believe any sport should touch, or government should touch religion, or anybody's faith for that matter. When you start playing with stuff like that, man, you're, you're playing with the unknown. Nobody knows for sure what could happen in the long run, or you know, the so-called end of days of when things are going to happen. I just think it's something taboo that people shouldn't even mess with. Uh, you know what? I want to know what those guys were doing the night they dreamed that up. Were those guys together partying somewhere in some hotel room, popping some pills? What were they doing? I want to know what kind of shit they were doing because that's out there, and I never, I never even heard about that, you know? But, but I can see where that would be a little controversial, but given those two characters, I know them both. Don't surprise me. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just picturing like Lady Gaga doing a remix in there somewhere. That would be so cool. <laughs> but you have to do that again, maybe. No offense. I mean, there are certain things that are sacred. Uh, I'm still a little upset because of the brother love issue. If you remember that. I never liked that. I thought it was sacrilegious. Uh, I just felt uncomfortable. I, w I wouldn't, if they asked me to do it or be involved in it, I'd have to decline. Jesus Christ. Um, for a Jewish kid to watch that, uh, it was very, it was, it, it was, uh, uh, it was geared to the ECW fans. I mean, not one ECW fan was insulted by that. ECW fans had a totally different mindset, a totally different way of looking at things. To them, that was cool. They'd want to see more of that. But if you get the uh, sports entertainment fan that sees that on TV or something like that, it's Ooh, blasphemy. You know, if you do something like that, you're going to offend a lot of people and we can't afford. I mean, I wouldn't want to afford to do something that would drop my fan base or drop fans from watching. Even, you know, yeah, we have fans from that don't believe in God, that do believe in God, that believe in something. So, you know, why even risk it? Why risk it? Why do something that crazy? But then they were known for doing crazy things. That's what put them on. That's what put them on TV. That's what that's what got them their name and got what recognition they got because they did stuff that was completely off the off the <laughs> beaten path. Wrestling is a three ring circus. I think everything could be out of bounds. <laughs> that's um, controversial. I, I I can see how that can make the list. Uh, I know that had a lot to do with Kurt Angle not coming to ECW. Or that, I think that, if I remember correctly, it was right before my, my time when I was there. I think I was Team Taz at the time. They, they did that angle. But uh, I think that was his deciding factor to not come to uh, ECW. And uh, it, it seemed like it, it, it paid off for him. You know what I mean? He seemed to do okay after that, you know, after making that decision. It didn't seem to hurt his career at all. So, uh, but as far as controversial, I mean, I think we did something controversial every night of the week, whether it be on TV or house show. So, I mean, that's just... Uh, 
to me, that's that's it's controversial, yes, to the normal person, but to me, it was just another night at work. <laughs> that was interesting. I actually don't remember who was crucified the night that Kurt Angle was in, and they tried to get him to join the company, and because he was such a good Christian, was it that night? Because I was there, and here I am talking to Kurt Angle, trying to sway him to come to ECW, and uh, they do the whole crucifixion. He was like, "Never, I will never work for this company." I'm not a huge religious person. I believe in karma, and maybe that was um, good or bad karma that day. But it's always nice. Uh, it's always a nice image crucifixion. So um, very cool. <laughs> Once again, was it good for ECW business? Sure. Was it the right thing to do? I say, I'm not a religious person, so I didn't care. But maybe to a lot of you know religious people out there, maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do. But I know Kurt Angle wasn't a big fan of it. <laughs> If they had a positive effect, it was short term. Mind you, they're out of business now because that's sh any kind of a shock jock radio or shock TV is it temporary. It, only, it, it captures people's attention for a very short period of time and then it's gone. There's so many ways to get heat. And in the business, we always talked about it's so easy to take shortcuts and to do things that you know are going to get a reaction. But, you know, it's, and I'm not even to draw a comparison, but, you know, I used to look at young guys in the business that would get in the corner and stand on the second turnbuckle and go, ah, and the fans would go, ah, and they think, boy, they really accomplished something. And they go to all four corners, and I just would shake my head, and, and uh, that's not talent. You know, so those kind of things is, People want reality, they want personal issues where, you know, it's you and I and we don't like each other or I did something to you and you did something to me and you're going to get me and I'm going to pay you back. That's what people want. Yeah, but when, you, when you talk about crucifixion angle, the closest thing I remember that was the entrance that The Undertaker made at a pay-per-view where he came down in a similar position that had tremendous controversy of overstepping a boundary of where wrestling somehow would be mentioned in the same breath with something with possible religious uh, connotations. The Undertaker at one point, uh, I believe, used, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, also uh, did a, uh, an angle with a, with a cross. Uh, but other than that, um, I think they've pretty, they, they've crossed color lines, but not, they really haven't done uh, anything that I remember clearly uh, about religion. Down with it, why not? They do movies, they do films all about Christ and crucifixion. Why not have it in wrestling? I would personally not be offended by anything religious or um, I, th I think um, getting more into people's personal, personal lives or uh, personal stories would have way more of an effect than, you know, something that I view as political science, such as religion or other um, news snippets. Well, anybody can do anything they want to do. It's up to them. I mean, it's something that I wouldn't do. I mean, it's religion sacred to me and what my religion is. And, you know, if you're going to make fun of it or do something like that, I don't think that's right. But if, if you're going to do something where it's going to bring more out and people will talk about it and good things, you know, maybe it would be good. But if it's something that's bad, I, I, I wouldn't do it. To them, they thought it was good. Me, I, I mean, yeah, I do. I believe in something. Yeah, I do. And w would I think that I would do something like that? No, thank you. Uh-uh. Well, I think the only person they're going to have to, you know, go to at the end is the man upstairs so it doesn't matter what we think it's it's what the man upstairs thinks the tragic in-ring death of owen hart will be forgotten by no one especially the horrified fans in attendance and also the heartbroken wrestlers in the locker room but was that show handled respectfully your second most controversial moment the show must go on. Uh, um, just the title, the show goes on, is sad. 
Wow, now you've touched on something very close to my heart. Boy, that's a tough call. Whoa, that's big, that's huge. Ah, man, that's, that's a tough one. Well, I still believe that when somebody falls from the ceiling, the show should probably stop. Ugh. It's a terrible, terrible thing, but what do you do? You know, I, I, that's a tough one. That's a tough call, you know? Well, that's a tragedy. I mean, for goodness sakes, if you can't stop a production at that time and people understand it, I, I don't know when you can. I, I know from the business side of it how big an investment the company has in a, in a pay-per-view, and it's easy to make the decision that, it, that you were justified to do it, and, and the, the easy answer is, well, uh, Owen would have wanted it himself, and that's, that's how he was committed to the business. But the truth of it is, uh, you know, and I relate to baseball, an umpire had a heart attack and died before the game started and collapsed on the field and basically the game was stopped and canceled. Again, that's one game, it's not a pay-per-view, but boy, that was a tough decision to make and I would not have wanted to have to make that decision. And uh, in a perfect world, you would like to have seen them say, that's it, stop the show and we'll refund people's money or do it again or something, but it didn't happen. I, I would think that you would shut the whole thing down and, you know, it's, it's a bad thing and the money you're going to lose and everything, it, it, that's not an issue. It's, it's a person's life and it's a friend of everybody's and, you know, I, I would think you'd stop the show. I think that definitely should be uh, a top five topic. I think, um, you know, unfortunately, it, I believe it happened fairly early on in the pay-per-view, and I think to you know to stop everything after that, it's a judgment call. Um, I think that you kind of show has to go on, show is going to go on regardless anyway eventually. So to go dark after that would have made you know m might have been more controversial later to stop the whole show, especially when people really maybe not been able to wrap their minds around what happened or what kind of uh, what what actually took place. I think you have, at that point you have to you have to work on impulse and you have to you have to go on with the show. Uh, and, and to be honest, if you would have asked, if you could have asked probably Owen, he probably would have said, I don't know him personally, but he probably would have said, you have to let the show go on because it's going to go on regardless. The show must go on because that's part of a performer. You have a buy rate that millions of people have already bought the show. You have to have the show continue. I don't think there was any insult to Owen that the show continued on. I try to put myself in Vince's position, you know. No, I would, yeah, uh, wouldn't have went on, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I loved Owen Hart to death, and but my own personal belief is the show has to go on, no matter what. I couldn't go out there, you know. I mean, it, it's, that'd be a tough, that'd be a tough one. You know, unless, unless you're going out there because they're doing something they have to, keep the people there to protect him, you know, his life or something, you know, the show goes on then, you know what I'm saying? If it's to help the situation out. But if it's just to make money or to lose some advertiser or something, then it would be a wrong thing to do. Me and Road Dog were on literally two matches after that. You know, it, there was, you know, there. There's a show that you have to put on. There's things that go wrong in every aspect of entertainment, life. Anything you do, there's a risk involved in everything. Um, should the show have went on, that's not for me to call. My deal is to do what is asked of me and what I get paid for and what people come to see the New Age Outlaws, which that's what's a part of what was going on at the time. When they came to see me in Road Dog, they want to see us. After something like that, I don't know, I can't, I can't speak for what was going on, but somebody made the decision, we did our jobs and went out there and performed the best that we can. Me and Brian were extremely close to Owen, tremendous guy, but we have to still do our jobs. I don't feel as if they should have stopped the pay-per-view because the needs of the many, now I know it sounds cruel, but it's fair to take a turn from Jake Roberts. The needs out of the, the, the many outweigh the needs of the few. Uh, there was a few people who thought, well, we should stop the pay-per-view and we shouldn't continue on with it. But accidents happen and 
because there's an accident on the freeway doesn't mean you stop the traffic all day that day. You stop the traffic only long enough to take care of the accident and then you move on. It's not like it was set up as an angle and the guy pops up. He's dead. Uh, I have a little respect for his family. Uh, I have a little respect for uh, yourself. It's only, it's only dollars. I mean, I'm sure that the sponsors or the production, they've could have, they put a old clips or something on. Uh, I mean, how fast is it when somebody of significance dies and they run to the truck or the production company and say, hey, let's bring on some stuff about his career, give him a little bit of uh, praise, and interview the people about how they felt about him. I remember hearing of it. I never saw it. Uh, I never even looked for footage afterwards to see, like everybody else did with the curiosity to try to find it. I, I never seen it. I don't want to see it. Um, but I heard about it, and uh, I remember hearing of it. I remember having the same reaction then as, you know, uh, not being surprised at all that they continued the pay-per-view at all, none. Whether they'd have said no and we'd have went home, or would they say the show goes on and we do it, we do our jobs to the best that we can do it. Day, night in and night out, day in, day out. I, I do remember um, hearing and seeing the event happen. And uh, at first, nobody believed it. You know, it was such a shocker. And then because the show did go on, um, I think in that moment of shock, personally, it confused me more. And um, then, of course, I saw him being taken into the back, and he was already blue in the face, and, and he, was, he was dead. He was dead. And it was very, I, I remember breaking down, really just broke down. And uh, I was not in very good condition at that time. But I, yeah, I mean, the show should stop. I mean. Uh, people were really wondering, you know, if it was real or not, or, you know, if it was somehow um, you know, fake. <laughs> but Owen Hart was one of my dearest friends in the wrestling business. We shared a passion for country music, and especially the uh, singer Colin Ray. And every time Owen and I would see each other, we'd start saying, one boy, one girl, two hearts bleed. I mean, we were just, we were insane at this. I went to Owen's funeral. Owen Hart was a good friend of mine. I brought my, my son James, who's in the NFL now, to, uh, to Owen's funeral. Um, I knew for a fact, and talking and riding in the cars with Owen Hart, that he did not want to do any of that coming down from the ceiling. He hated rappelling down by the cable. All, it, Owen was a, people didn't know, Owen was a kindergarten teacher by heart. He had a degree in teaching. He just wanted to get a couple more years done in the wrestling business and get some financial security for his family and go teach. And uh, it was ironic when he fell because uh, it was just probably a, a month before that that he had stopped through my house and watched my kids play hockey because his kids were getting to that age, Owen Jr. And uh, it was a sad thing. I personally don't know if I could have gone on because I was very close with Owen. We traveled on the road together. He ribbed me, I ribbed him. You know, I mean, we were, we were friends. Um, but and an another way to look at it, you can't really shut down this multi-million dollar production. You know, I mean, it is a absolutely one of the most horrible things that has ever happened in this business, but, you know, how much of a hit would that company have taken? I'm, I'm sure there would have been fans upset too. I mean, fans upset that it went on, fans upset if it didn't go on. So that's, oh man, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, if I was working in the show, I probably would have had a real hard time working after that. I don't know if I could have. Well, you know, <clears throat> I know I knew Owen pretty well, and uh, Owen was the kind of guy that nobody could ever say anything negative about Owen. He was a family man, and he had his priorities straight, and. Uh, <sighs> Only the good die young, you know? That holds fast to this situation. But the show went on, it shouldn't have. Owen was one of the funniest people, one of the best pranksters I've ever met in my life. And, uh, but to get to the question, should the show have gone on? No. 
I don't think so. I think uh, at that point, um, I don't know what I would have done, but I don't know if I would have just continued the wrestling at that point. I might have just tried to do something. It's a tough question. Uh, one end of me says no. The other end of me is going like, well, if it's going to take the focus off what happened so it can be clear to get him to the hospital and tend to him, um, yeah, maybe it was the right decision. I don't know what I would have done at that moment. And remember, for somebody like Vince McMahon, that's a momentary decision. It's not something that requires, uh, that takes a lot of thought. So what he did at that point, maybe that was right. This just stopped the pay-per-view. I mean, there's things that you just stop things for. I remember being there when, with Chris Benoit and I was there when Eddie Guerrero passed and every time all I could think is, how can anybody get their mind right? Uh, I just, I remember how sad everybody was at those two. And I wasn't there, of course, um, when Owen, but um, yeah, I just, I think it's sad. It's so sad to think that the show must go on because it really didn't because he was gone. When I first started in wrestling, my first match, first match, I was in a tag match. A guy dies in the front row, we're in a two out of three falls. Guy dies in the front row. They take us out of the ring, put us back in the dress room. I'm taking a shower. Promoter says, where are you going? Ace Freeman's promoter outside of Pittsburgh. Where are you going? I said, well, the guy died. Aren't you going to stop? Well, no, they're going to get him out of here in five minutes. I thought, my God, what a brutal business. I remember when Davey Boy died, um, I was actually working on an indie show in Queens, and I was just about to go to the ring when my phone rang, and it was Diana, and she, out of the, she just said, hi, Tammy, it's Diana, Davey Boy just died. And I, I was just like, oh, that, first of all, that's a nice way to tell me. <laughs> Second of all, he was one of my best friends, so yeah, I couldn't work that night, and that was just an indie show. So I don't think I could have gone on, you know, international television awards. But wow. yeah, may, maybe they could have, taken a pause or at least pause the show for a little while, but uh, uh, it's not my call. <laughs> and by the way, you know, Owen's, Owen is still thought of all the time. I mean, I think about him often and he's missed by everybody. We thought we offered you guys some tough choices from our original list of 17 that you had to choose from. But you guys thought there was only one runaway most controversial moment. Taking 47% of the vote, it's the Montreal screw job. Dun dun! Number one controversial moment in wrestling. That has to be number one. You know, if I think about it, yeah, that's that's awesome. <laughs> really? Um. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the Montreal screw job is wrestling. It's wrestling. It's part of the business. I think that happens every day, all the time. Who cares? Whoop de do. You know? That's how it used to be, you know? People tell somebody to do something one way and, you know, the other guy in there would, you know, screw them or do whatever has to be done. That's where professional wrestling was professional wrestling. It's not all the entertainment business. I don't even think that was very controversial myself. I don't see what the big deal is. Come on. What is the big deal of that? I don't get what the big deal is because Brett went crazy. You know, Sean was only doing what Sean's doing. Vince had to do what was right for the company. Somebody doesn't want to drop something at a certain time, you drop it. When the boss comes to you and say, hey, I want you to drive me over here, you don't go, I ain't driving you nowhere. You ain't getting in my car. Brett should have freaking done what Vince has wanted him to do. You know, big deal. Come on. Yeah, I was right there. I was right there for the Montreal screw job too. I was sitting right next to Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy Smith. Um, I still don't know what to think of that screw job. Half of me wants to believe it was a shoot, and half of me wants to believe it was bullcrap. Wow. The Montreal screw job, to me, was so well planned out. To this day, I don't care who says what, I don't buy it. Although, and, and, and I might piss a lot of people off by saying this, um, Wrestling with Shadows, I saw it in a van with a bunch of guys who we were driving to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and I think Wrestling with Shadows was a, uh, is probably one of the biggest works ever. 
Uh, I don't. I don't believe. I don't believe. I. I, I can't. I find it hard to believe that that Vince McMahon let a, a camera come around and document that whole thing while it was going on. But uh, the screw job itself, yeah, absolutely, the most controversial moment. And uh, what a what a great way to take a take a title off somebody than than to do it that way. Mm. Oh my God, that was insane. It was. I, I, that was such a crazy night when Brett walked out of Vince's room and then Vince walked out with a black eye. It was, this was always my opinion. Maybe I'm looking into it too much, but it was way too quick for Vince to have such a black eye. I was right there up until the point where Vince got punched in the locker room. And then I, I got asked to leave the locker room, so I never got to see a punch thrown. So, but I did see Bret Hart's wife's reaction. She was livid, cursing out everybody in the back, and I was one of the people that she came up yelling to in a positive sense because I knew the Hart family very well. Um, could I believe it was a total screw job all the way? Yeah. Could I believe they worked the whole thing? Yeah. They wanted to get Brett out of there some way, and I guess that was the only way they felt they could do it. Um, what Do I think Sean was in on it? Yeah. I would have sided with Brett if it was legit. Because I don't think Brett's the kind of guy that mixes too many words. I think Brett said it was a shoot, and it was a shoot. Brett, you were wrong. That's my position. And I don't, you know, controversial. Vince was right. Brett was wrong. I know, freaking, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get backlash from that. And I love you, Brett, but you were wrong. Brett Hart was, you know a star of the company for many years. He still is a, a superstar. You know, um, I, I felt he really got wronged. And, um, but on many occasions, Vince just does what he wants to do. Is it right? Absolutely not. He feels he was wronged. And since it's the entertainment business and scripted and all this, they changed the script on him so they they on purpose screwed him. So yeah, he had his uh, right to be mad. Everyone was given the opportunity to step forward and do the right thing. They knew what, what was gonna happen and they had sat down and planned it all out that, uh, you know, we want you to do this and we want him to do this and, and we'd like for you, you're leaving the company and the right thing for you to do would be do this. And same as they sat down with me when I refused to do the, uh, the, the angle. It wasn't about Randy at all, had nothing to do with him, but I just felt like it wasn't time for me to, to, to lose the belt on television. If they said we'll do it tomorrow night off TV, I'd have said, sure, no problem. But, uh, you know, Brett had his issues with losing in Canada as opposed to maybe losing anywhere. Again, you know, working in the inside, it's, that was a business decision. And I see both sides of the story because I understand how much Brett uh, valued his being a Canadian and how he was looked at with the success that, the success that he reached as a, as a heavyweight champion. And it wasn't that Brett didn't want to go out the right way and, as Vince called it, do the honors. Uh, Brett came from a background where he understood that that was the right thing to do. He just didn't want to do it in Montreal. I can't drop it in Montreal because I'm Canadian. Um, you know, I put over a fake Dorian the Clown 20 minutes from my house in New Jersey. You know, it happens, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Brett, Vince gave you your biggest break in the business. You were there when I was there in 85, when I was gone, you carried on, you got a break with Neidhart as a tag team, he made you into a superstar. He made you into a superstar. Okay, things evolve. We all get older, we have to pass the torch, we have to do what's asked of us. Okay, so you have creative, you have your creative hand in the thing. Okay, cool. But when when it's asked of you to do something, and then you, but you know, I I look at both sides of that. Well, first of all, Brett, I would have never done what you did. I would have done what was asked of me, and I would have got myself over in the match. So the finish wouldn't have mattered. That's, that's what it, my argument to so many guys out there. They all, I can't do that, I can't do that. If you go out there and you get yourself over, it doesn't matter what you do, because people are gonna remember you for what you were doing out there. You were entertaining them for 15 minutes. Why should they be concerned about three seconds? I think it was the wrong thing to do to Brett. 
Um, at the time, I had just ended a very close relationship with Sean, but we won't go into that. Um, so I wasn't exactly a fan of his at the moment, but it was definitely the wrong thing to do for, due to Brett. I mean, I'm sure there's other ways you could have, you know, finished that up. But yeah, that was that was that was a little effed up. <laughs> there for a couple years, all I heard was how upset he was, how despicable did he do this, and then I think I remember. Uh, didn't Bret Hart go back to work for Vince? So how upset was he? Case closed. Here's what I think happened here. The company was in trouble. Bret Hart was going away to WCW. They were in real big trouble, and what are we going to do? Well, Dan, why don't we make Mr. McMahon the biggest badass heel in the history of this business? How? We're going to screw you in the middle of the ring. This is what's going to happen and nobody's gonna know the difference, and hey, Brett, you wanna punch me out afterwards? Do it. Well, there's no question. I mean, that's not the way to handle any situation. Vince wouldn't want it done to him. You get paid to do this job and very well, and when they say to do something and you don't do it, and well, they'll, be, <laughs> they'll find ways around it. Vince is a master and he'll find ways around it. Vince wants what he wants, and I love him for being, um, for being Vince McMahon, for lasting longer than any other television show on television. <laughs> so, yes, it sucks. But at the end of the day, like, everything comes around. What goes around comes around, and um, it's wrestling. Come on, shit happens. <laughs> it was a business decision made by the company to do the best interests of the, the company that this man owned. Do I, think it was, do I think it was just a lesson to be learned? Yeah, I do. You don't mess with Vince McMahon, or when you do your job, whether it's you know, in the States or in Canada or wherever it is, it doesn't matter. I mean, I just, I just it was so, I, so overboard to me. It really was, it just went, it was craziness, craziness. Vince, the owner of the company, can yeah. do anything he wants to do. If that's how he wants to switch titles or do whatever he wants to do, he has the right to do anything he wants to do. And that's what he did. And if whoever doesn't like it, they don't ever have to work for him or they don't have to take his money. I'll take Vince's side in that. And, and not to be an ass kisser, maybe I'll get a spot someday, but um, just because, you know, Brett's leaving. Uh, he's, he, he's, he's leaving the company, it's a pay-per-view. Um, drop the belt. What's, what's the problem? Drop the fucking belt, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're going to WCW, you're making a boatload of money, uh, you're getting paid, uh, be a professional. And like we said, it's fixed anyway. You know, drop the belt. Be a professional, drop the fucking belt, Brett. Vince made a tough decision again to involve some other people and said this is the way it has to be done. And, uh, it wouldn't have been number one on my list. Ringing the bell early didn't mean he beat me. The guy across the, across the ring better have a, a damn good excuse or he's not getting the belt. Or he might get the belt, but he might not leave the ring the way he came in. Back in that day, I was really kind of in that crew. You know, I was directly involved, but indirectly involved. I didn't know anything that was happening, but you know, I kind of just minded my business and listened when I was talked to, and otherwise I just kind of did my own thing. So I was completely shocked. I, I thought, you know, when they were talking about the match or whatever, that, you know, it was just kind of common stuff. You know, if, if somebody does one move, how are you going to react? Or maybe this person has, you know, a, an ego that night and they might do something, you know, or if they make a mistake, how are you going to, how are you going to balance that out? Um, when it happened, I was just as much in shock as everybody else. And then I remember walking back to the hotel after that and there was this rabid fan, this girl, and she jumped on my back and she was, ah, you know, and I was like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> Because I was right there in the hallway outside a locker room door. Brett walked out literally a minute later. Vince walked out. And I don't know if you've ever had a black eye before, but I have. It takes a little while for that eye to actually get that black. 
Um, so actually, Chris Candido and I always had our own little uh, idea that <laughs> that it was this was our you know espionage idea that we had back in the day that. It was set up beforehand, they knew it was gonna happen, and we always said, we bet you that Vince had his own son punch him in the eye, make it look good, make it come out, so it would look like Brad did it. That was always our little espionage theory. <laughs> if I was really upset with him, I certainly wouldn't go to work for him again. No matter how much money he's offered me, it's a matter of principle. I knew that there was something going on, but I thought maybe it was a personal disagreement or some kind of tension, which is sometimes normal between, you know, two top performers. So, but I never expected that, not in a million years. Maybe Ted DiBiase was right, everybody's got a price. It didn't justify taking his belt back, but people are still talking about it to this day. So did it hurt or did it help him? I don't know, because if that didn't happen, would they still be talking about it? Who knows? But because it happened, because the screw job happened, that's something for people to talk about. It's for stories to go on. Um, there has been so many things that have happened that I've seen in the past that I'm glad happened just because you know that that person's name is now in infamy. I think they were all in on it. Everybody was in on it. And today it is still one of the most controversial um, pieces of business in wrestling. But I will never believe that they weren't all in on it. That's just my take. And I've been in that situation a few times myself, and I'm not alone. Can you take the belt from me? If you can, you can have it. If you can't, I'm gonna walk out with the belt.